overtube assisted pneumatic dilation for achalasia in megaesophagus. A 63 year old man with a long standing history of achalasia presented with dysphagia and regurgitation of food. Achalasia was initially diagnosed on upper GI series in 1993. The diagnosis was confirmed on esophageal manometry in 2008. The patient had a history of several pneumatic balloon dilations over the last several years had shown. Also, he was relatively asymptomatic in between dilations and he had refused surgery in the past. The patient had modified his diet over the last few years to consist of a semi-solid and pureed diet. We decided to proceed with upper endoscopy for pneumatic balloon dilation. Previous barium esophagram had shown a markedly dilated and redundant esophagus with pooling of contrast, absence of peristalsis, and very slow passage of contrast into the stomach, consistent with achalasia. The findings on upper endoscopy were quite striking. The entire esophagus was massively dilated, tortuous, and cavernous with copious amounts of retained food within the esophagus. There were multiple levels of sharp angulations making scope passage into the stomach very difficult. This is a good example of the so-called megaesophagus seen in achalasia. There were several technical problems during the case. Number one, there was difficulty in advancing the EGD scope due to a tortuous esophagus which caused scope looping. Number two, the guide wire could be placed into the stomach, but the pneumatic balloon catheter could not be advanced over the guide wire to the gastroesophageal junction due to a tortuous esophagus. Number three, retained food in the esophagus limited visualization to directly manipulate the balloon catheter into the stomach by endoscope assistance. All the above factors led to one prior unsuccessful pneumatic balloon dilation at our institution. To overcome these problems, we placed the patient on two days of a clear liquid diet prior to endoscopy and used general anesthesia with endotracheal intubation to reduce the risk of aspiration. Most importantly, we used a 50 cm long gastric overtube for esophageal intubation to achieve a relatively straight path into the stomach as we will demonstrate. A 50 cm long gastric overtube with an outer diameter of 19.5 mm is introduced over the scope and the overtube is introduced into the proximal stomach and the scope is withdrawn. The correct positioning of the overtube is confirmed under direct endoscopic visualization. A guide wire is passed into the stomach. The location of the gastroesophageal junction is marked externally using paper clips and the scope is withdrawn. After overtube placement, it becomes easy to advance a stiff balloon catheter across the gastroesophageal junction. The gastric overtube is now retracted back more proximally in the esophagus, and the balloon catheter itself is retracted back as well to bring the waste of the balloon at the level of the gastroesophageal junction marked by the external paper clip. On fluoroscopy, the waste of the balloon is marked by the two closely spaced black dots. After correct positioning of the balloon waste at the gastroesophageal junction, the pneumatic balloon is slowly inflated to a pressure of 20 psi and minor adjustments are made during the inflation process to prevent proximal or distal migration of the balloon. A mucosal tear with minimal bleeding was seen at the gastroesophageal junction after pneumatic balloon dilation, which is expected. There was no recurrence of dysphagia at a six-month interval. In conclusion, the use of an overtube allows for a relatively rigid pneumatic balloon catheter to take a straight path through a tortuous esophagus. Technical success can be achieved easily using overtube-assisted pneumatic balloon dilation in previously failed cases. An overtube is standard equipment in endoscopy units and no special devices are required for the technique described in this video.